My name is Ashok Gadgil. I'm the director of the Environmental Energy Technologies Division. Um, and before I introduce a speaker, today's, today's distinguished speaker, I think it takes, um, it, it makes sense to, to highlight why it's critically important to bring together um, people who are on the cutting edge, on the bleeding edge, as, as we talked a moment ago, of how to bring finance and markets and business uh, on very large scale to enable the transition to a low carbon future. The transition to the low carbon future won't happen just because we are terribly inventive in the lab or we are very good scientists and engineers. That's, that's an essential, but only part of the solution. What we also need is to be able to move uh, on the order of $100 billion per year into the technologies and processes that we come up with, uh, have, have investments, have markets, have policies uh, and regulations to make the markets work. And all of this is critically important that, that we understand as scientists and engineers working on problems of a low carbon future, uh, problems that are directly relevant to carbon cycle 2.0. So I'm, I'm today really uh, very pleased to have Mark Stewart visit us. Uh, he has been on the leading edge of the carbon market problems way back before most of us even were aware that this was going to be a very big deal or this is going to be critically important for solving problems on the planetary scale. Uh, he in 1997, founded EcoSecurities, which was, I guess, the first company to do this, which was the largest CDM project development firm and trading company in the world, uh, ending up competing with uh, Sumitomo and Goldman Sachs in terms of capturing and selling carbon credits out of, I think, 70 different countries, if I wow. understood right. Uh, uh, eventually, uh, getting taken over or bought by J.P. Morgan at the end of 2009. Uh, and now he has actually his new firm, Elotrope Partners, invests in early stage opportunities uh, in technology and execution platforms around the world that are positioned to thrive uh, in the transition to the low carbon economy. So there is some amount of new language that we'll hear, there is some amount of uh, learning some of us have to do in terms of how we understand how that end of the global transition works with the technology end. Uh, Mark has also been on, the, on, on the, the leading edge in terms of policies that set the carbon trading uh, in place, including working, uh, uh, I mean, he was the first chair of the International Emissions Trading Association. Uh, project developers working group. He's been um, the vice chair. Uh, he is the vice chair of the Verified Carbon Standards Association and consulted with every single major player that I'm aware of in this business. So without further ado, Mark. Thanks a lot. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Ashok and Tom Kirchstetter for, for the invitation here. Uh, this is very, this is gonna be very interesting for me as well. I mean, normally, I never assume that I walk into a room that I'm the smartest person in the room, but Tom sent me some bios of the people I was gonna be meeting, and now I'm very concerned I might be the dumbest person in the room. Uh, this is a very, very impressive place, and uh, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. Um, as Ashok said, you know, I've been in what was the carbon market, you know, starting, frankly, in the early 1990s, you know, really with Rio, and my, my talk today is really not to talk about the specifics of the market, to a large extent, to really talk about sort of the trajectory that we've seen for the last number of years around, you know, starting in 1992 with Rio, moving to Kyoto, moving through the early years of trading systems around Kyoto in Europe and Japan, culminating in Copenhagen a couple of years, two years ago when 
when the trajectory that we had set out at Rio and Kyoto fell off the tracks and really what the implications of that are. As Ashok said, you know, we are, we're in a situation where you know, technology is an extraordinary, extraordinary you know, part of the solution, but it's not the only part of the solution. What it is, it is one aspect around policy, around technology, around capital, and around basically business development, around who is going to put in the low carbon world. If we're, if we're going to have a low carbon world, what does that mean? Who builds the businesses and what are the incentives that we as society are going to use to help those things happen faster than they otherwise would? Carbon markets were, and the global carbon market around Kyoto was one, was one such thing, and it was, it was a, you know, moderately effective as we'll go through, but it was effective in ways that I think that, you know, may be a little bit more surprising to you than, than, than you might think at this juncture. I'm a little bit challenged right now because, as I hope all of you do when you put together a slideshow for a new audience like this, you just basically blatantly steal from old slideshows and put things in different order like I do. So I don't know exactly what's coming up. I don't have a screen here, so I'm going to have to turn around to figure out what I'm supposed to say next as well. So I hope you'll, you'll be forgiving of that, that as well. So, I mean, I don't think I really need to speak to this. I mean, you know, I'll just give a quick thing. We're dealing with you know, an enormous problem that, you know, that goes across basically the entire global economy. Energy, transport, land use, everything. And you know, we, we need, you know, we, we, it is not, there is no silver bullet to the, to the carbon issue. It's a, as a colleague of mine once said, it's a silver shotgun, it's a shotgun approach. Uh, we need silver buckshot. We need lots of different things and we need to make an enormous amount of reinvestment. But I think the key thing to remember is that if we continue to manage our global economy and the aspirations of the world around economic growth, here's some basic numbers. Sometime in the 2030 range, we probably need to have a global GDP that is approximately three to four times as big as it is today. That's not, that's not an outrageous assumption. Somewhere in that neighborhood, while at the same time we need to drop emissions on some sort of trajectory by some amount. We can say maybe by 20, 25% by that point. You know, if we're talking 80% by 2050 goal, we have to be somewhere on that down. That implies that every unit of GDP has to, has to basically be operating on anywhere from you know, approximately one-fourth to one-sixth the amount of carbon that it is today. Okay? That, is enormous, that is an enormous challenge. And it is a challenge that runs across, the, say, energy delivery, transport, the way we manage our society. And so, that creates both challenges and, as the Chinese like to say, both challenges and opportunities. And I think that what I'm going to speak to is how we've done this you know, up to date and where I think things are going in the future. So 20 years, Rio. Who would have thought that 20 years ago at Rio we'd be still having this conversation around whether this was worth some, something worth doing? I, don't even, I even think the first George Bush administration would have been shocked that we wouldn't be doing something at this point. Rio was not a, I'm, I'm sort of walking through this, but Rio was not something that was, um, you know, there was no obligation. So the only re obligation in Rio was we're going to agree to do things in the future. We're going to agree to collaborate. We're going to, we're going to ask for positive, you know, actions from industrial countries, and we're going to encourage reductions in developing countries. But there was no, there was no teeth behind it. The one thing that came out of Rio was sort of this radical idea that you know, was spawned by a combination of economists and Norwegians, the best that I can tell, um, which was the idea that countries should cooperate, that there were tremendous opportunities to reduce emissions across you know, de developing countries that were going through large emission growth trajectories, and that if we could find ways to reduce those emissions before they happened, those were the cheapest ways to deal with emissions rather than going into you know, industrialized economy with economies that already had their infrastructure fairly set and that the changeover of assets was going to take, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. So this was called activities implemented jointly, but the reality is nobody actually agreed what that meant. Some people said it was a market, some people said it was development aid, some people said it was just hand us some cash, you know, and some people view that, or some view that as government agreements, but that was sort of the, the initial impetus of what ultimately became the carbon market. So we're 20 years old, what happened? Kyoto, five years after Rio. I mean, in, in reality, what we think about now, now, five years was light speed, okay? You know, but at the time, it seemed like a long time. So 
So we're getting to the point where, of Kyoto where what, was, what were the main drivers of the different players around the table? Europe really just wanted emission caps. Everybody should be capped. They hated the idea of what became emissions trading. There was just, this is you know, some sort of American scam is pretty much the way it was generally projected. Americans wanted you know, fi flexibility for meeting any kind of emissions cap. They wanted trading. They didn't want the cap, but they wanted trading, which actually doesn't make any sense, but that's what the Americans wanted. The developing world largely wanted you know, technology and finance. Russia, whose entire economy had collapsed, you know, was the world's largest emitter, or very close to it, in 1988, and was approximately half of what it had been you know, 10 years before, basically wanted some sort of compensation for the fact that their economy had collapsed and they weren't emitting as much, so they, they wanted something as well. Japan, because they were the host country, they wanted any deal. Japan, you know, the Kyoto Protocol, we cannot have newspapers that say, world talks collapse in Kyoto. That was the only thing Japanese really wanted. Beyond that, they were just going to make sure that that was it. And China and India were, you know, were basically just at the beginnings of you know, their tremendous economic trajectory that we're seeing to this date. I mean, the reality is if you go back and look, China's emissions were approximately 40% of America's emissions in 1997 in Kyoto period. They passed us in 2009, okay? Who would have predicted that at that moment? You know, I mean, so it's just really just starting. All of these things coalesced, and I mean, I was in Kyoto, and up until you know, literally the last minute, the general assumption was that this thing was going to fall apart. Nobody thought this was going to happen. Okay, last minute, you know, basically, Gore flies in, the Japanese cave on something, the Europeans say, "Oh, find this emissions trading," and lo and behold, you have caps and trading. And you know, as I say, it was was that you know, was that you know, a harbinger of something good, or was that just a complete anomaly? I don't know. I think we'll find that out in another 50 years or so. But emissions trading was sort of a key aspect that brought all these things together. That was what we could agree on, that how we would help the developing world, how countries would meet objectives with, you know, with le least amount of economic uh, dislocation, you know, how we'd compensate the Russians, everything was all embedded in that one thing. So, so why emissions trading? I mean, let's just go back to some fairly basic economics 101. Um, you know, there's just incredibly different cost curves around reducing emissions in different sectors in different countries. I mean, I think, you know, anybody who's done work in this space knows that there are certain things that, you know, literally cost, you know, cents or dollars a ton, or in some cases appear to have negative costs per ton, but don't actually happen. Uh, there are other, you know, say when you start looking at, for example, in the late 90s when Japan was looking at their economy, you know, their marginal ton, if they had to do everything domestically in Japan without, the, without any form of trading, was going to be in the hundreds of dollars a ton. Any, you know, any businessman worth his salt who knows that there's a way he can create something for a couple pennies a ton and sell it potentially for up to $100 a ton in some other place is going to go out and do that. Okay, so that's the fundamental, is that there are lots of low-cost opportunities out there across many sectors. Uh, as I say, within industrialization, within land use, within, every, but in theory, virtually anything you know, that is in the global economy has an emissions trading aspect in one fashion or another. There's really almost nothing we do as a society that doesn't involve emissions, whether it's around agriculture, whether you know, agriculture and food, energy delivery, transport, entertainment, et cetera. You know, in theory, every single asset you look, has, look at has an emissions signature and some way of reducing that assets, you know, the production of that assets emissions. So it is, you know, it is intellectually compelling as anything. However, when an intellectually compelling idea meets political reality, sometimes it doesn't come out quite the way you would have hoped. So we've got to Kyoto. Everybody agrees. Everybody, you know, you know staggers home and says, what the heck did we agree to? Okay, you know. So, Basically, so essentially the, the Kyoto Agreement was supposed to start in 2008. That was the other thing. We gave ourselves an 11-year runway to actually figure this out, which was probably fairly intelligent. And, but the real beginning of the emissions world curiously started in 2005 when the European Union started essentially an experimental phase of emissions trading that allowed these types of credits to come in from outside of, outside of Europe. Now, you have to remember, under Kyoto, there were two classes of countries. Industrialized countries and non-industrialized countries. Industrialized countries had caps. US, Canada, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, handful of, and Russia, 
And then there were, the, there were the developing countries, which was China, India, Mexico, Brazil, et cetera, et cetera, who, um, who basically had no caps, but had the ability to access capital flows and technology flows via this mechanism that was called the Clean Development Mechanism and the CDM. The CDM is the institution that drove my life for basically 10 years. Uh, you know, there was, this is what we did. You know, we, we went out there as a company and we went and found these projects, financed these projects, bought credits from these projects, advised these projects, whatever it was, whether it was a landfill gas project, an industrial, an industrial efficiency project, a, anything that could reduce emissions, you know, talking about everything you can do, as long as the rules allowed it and we could find a way to, to produce a ton of reductions that was cheaper than the market price, we were interested, in theory. Okay, and so we as a firm, this is what we did. So in this process, you, the idea of Kyoto was there was relatively balanced supply and demand. The US, because of the cap it agreed to take, Europe, and Can Europe, Canada, US, Australia, the caps they agreed to take, roughly balanced against the excess emissions that Russia was, had managed to negotiate for themselves at Kyoto and then some spare surplus would come in through this CDM mechanism from developing countries. However, those of you who have taken Economics 101 will, can tell you that when you get supply and demand in balance, you have a real problem. So all of a sudden, the demand from US and Canada and Australia disappeared. The US you know, Senate said from day one, we are not gonna ratify the Kyoto Protocol. They said that actually not after the Kyoto Protocol, most people, you know, it's always been said many times, they said, but they actually said that before the Kyoto Protocol, we will not ratify the Kyoto Protocol or whatever comes out of Kyoto. Uh, Australia, similar thing, jo uh, John Howard pulled out in 2001. Can it, Canada actually ratify but decide not to do anything about it, thus proving the, you know, how useful international law actually is. Um, so all of a sudden we have a fairly substantial gap in the demand side. What that functionally did right off the bat was pull the Russians out. The Russians didn't care anymore because the reality was that they were planning to basically get a massive economic transfer from the Americans and the Canadians, and now since they weren't buying anymore, Russia's excess emissions from the, from the Soviet era were basically useless at that point. So, but at the same time, Europe has now wholly embraced the idea of emissions trading. They set up a system where ultimately approximately 13,000 emitting entities around Europe, factories uh, and power plants and the like, were handed a number of allowances by the European Union, and that was a declining number over time, and you could either buy allowances from somebody who had too much because they had reduced, or you could buy credits from this clean development mechanism that we were involved in. So Japan did it slightly differently. Japan sends their conglomerates out, you know, Sumitomo, Marobeni, Mitsubishi, Toyota Susho, et cetera. They send them out to go out there and acquire credits on behalf of Japan. Okay, it wasn't really done in a market setting, they, but rather in just essentially a go out there and you know, get this commodity that we've agreed to, even though we're not exactly sure why we did in the first place, other than the fact that these people put it in our city and we had to sign. Okay, I hate to say it, that's you know, honestly the truth. The developing world starts setting up this infrastructure to develop these projects, okay? Whether it's, you know, wind projects or efficiency projects or solar or landfill gas or industrial gas destruction projects, all of a sudden there's this land rush for finding projects that can reduce emissions. And we were a facilitator within that. We, you know, our capital and our, and our expertise was within that space. We were part of that private sector there that raised billions of dollars. Um, we were a publicly traded company in London for approximately five years. We were not the only publicly traded company. There were multiple funds that were raised in the hundreds of millions or billions of dollars that were basically looking for that arbitrage, that price differential between what you could get a credit for and what you could sell it for. And that was a mix of people doing project finance, doing you know, really just you know, core emissions trading, you know, even some degrees, some technology venture capital. All of this was managed through the United Nations. And the CDM that I keep talking about was a UN system in which there only was a value. You only had a credit was useful when the UN basically blessed it that day and said you can have the credit and they issued it out to you. Until that moment occurred, you had a contingent asset that was worth nothing until you had it. And so that was a real challenge. So that became ultimately the, you know, one of the key challenges, and we'll talk about that a little bit.
China, who, you know, through 2004, we all kind of were watching China going, wonder what they're going to do about this. You know, there's a lot of emissions there. They didn't do a darn thing until about 2004. Then all of a sudden, yeah, you know, I mean, essentially, you can actually go back and you can look at some of the analysis of which countries were the most business friendly for the CDM and things like that. And it was always Malaysia and Brazil and Mexico. Then China was never in there. All of a sudden, China does what China does in any market, which is basically yawn, wake up, basically take it over. And that's exactly what they did. You know, it was just, it was remarkable in a period of about literally 12 to 18 months how China went from being, you know, oh, well, we wonder what they're going to do to pretty much more than half of the market like that. Okay, so we go through this phase of the market. So basically Europe has this trading system, you know, credits, your allowances and credits are trading sort of in the 10 to 15, 10 to 20 euro range, generally in the low teens is where, where we're, we're supplying credits into that market. Our acquisition price is roughly eight euros a ton on average, you know, but we have all the costs of putting these projects through the system, et cetera. But by this point, you know, we've gone through some cycles and, you know, nobody is quite convinced what's going to happen post-2012 because the Kyoto Agreement from, from 2008 to 2012 and then basically ends. You know, there's, not, there's nothing that says there is an agreement that we will agree later to do something sort of like this again and we're going to try to have these caps continue and get tighter and tighter, but there is nothing beyond that. It is a, it is a snapshot in time agreement. And so, China, as I said, has become the biggest market and basically developing countries and all of these infrastructure out there that's looking for, for ways of reducing emissions is basically China fighting over the scraps left over to supply the market that the four major countries, Brazil, I Brazil India, Mexico, and China are left, left out. Japan gets nothing. Japan, oh, excuse me, Russia gets nothing. Japan uh, essentially starts realizing that they signed on to agreement that they had really no upside from whatsoever other than basically just sending out capital to buy these credits because Japan quite rightly started making the point that we keep developing these incredibly emissions positive technologies around efficiency, et cetera. We're exporting those like crazy, but you know, in terms of the emissions that are being reduced by our technologies, we don't get squat. Okay? And the classic example is you know, Prius. You know, essentially, you know, the, the fact that the Jap Japanese pushed the hybrid technology and got out there and took that risk you know, but those, you know, emissions from, you yeah, know, that's just one. I mean, there's a gazillion more in the industrial side, but nice little, you know, cogent example. Why isn't Japan getting, you know, some sort of emissions benefit from the fact that they took the risk on building the Prius? Good point for the Japanese. So Europe is basically obsessed by the time they get to Copenhagen of we have to make this grow. We have to, you know, this, this idea of the UN running this whole thing is the only way that's going to work. It has to be a super sovereign approach of the UN. And, um, and I think that there's, you know, I think that's, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a reason for that, which is, you know, when it comes down to, you know, geopolitics um, and uh, real politique, Europe, European countries have already basically handed over a substantial chunk of their sovereignty to the European Union. When you look at it from a real politique perspective, it makes m great sense for them to try to get more countries to do the same on as many different levels as possible. Okay, it is not because they want to be good guys and they want to think, but you know, frankly, they've made this decision and they'd like other people to do it as well because that advantages them in the long run. And the U.S. Um, by the time we get to Copenhagen, you know, you know, the Obama administration has clearly indicated that climate is a second-order issue to healthcare. Uh, there's already pushback on that on a number of different levels, and they do not, they do not feel they have the the political capital to spend to jam something through in Copenhagen. So what happens? Copenhagen collapses, okay? The post-2013, from the perspective of the UNFCCC, frankly doesn't exist, okay? There is no global regulatory regime after 2012 per se. Now, you know, again, we're maybe changing at some point, but what happened? What was emission? You know, let, let's 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 review a little bit of what you know why you know whether emissions trading really worked and what went right and what went wrong. Okay, one you know the idea you know eff effectively just like China takes over other markets, China took over this market. It makes perfect sense. China is you know is the world's largest emitter, and uh, you know they they found this you know tremendous ability to bring in you know frankly, billions of dollars worth of, of trade capital for reducing emissions on the margin. Um, 
that made it much more difficult to sell the rest of the developing world on the utility of continuing with this system. Again, there was just not, you know, the demand was just being sopped up by the Chinese. You know, again, makes perfect sense. You, you, you reduce emissions where the emissions are, so that makes, you know, absolute sense. Um, the UN process turned out to be a horrendous nightmare. Um, and I don't just say that from the perspective that I gained 20 pounds and lost most of my hair on top. On top. It, is, it comes from the perspective of, you know, ultimately to make long-term investments work, you need to have regulatory certainty. And the UN process was extraordinarily uncertain and almost arbitrary at times. Uh, and I don't, and what, 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 what the problem with that is, you know, for example, when we would first sign a project and we thought we'd be, we'd be moving forward with a, with a project, our initial assumption was that from signing a project to doing the documentation to getting it validated by an outside party and to bring it to the UN and to get it registered should take basically 90 to 150 days. Um, by the middle of 2006, 2007, it was averaging closer to 15 to 18 months, okay? From the perspective of firms like us that were taking capital risk to put things out there, that's an unacceptable risk. I mean, it becomes an unacceptable risk because we don't get paid until that project registers and issues credits. So we're taking all that, absorbing all that risk, and there's also the risk that they're not going to issue, the, they're not going to register the project. There were arbitrary changes of the rules at various times. There were, all I'm saying is that, you know, there, they may have been environmentally correct. But from the perspective of mobilizing capital and creating long-term incentives that actually work, that is an extraordinary disincentive. You know, when you, when you go to an investor and you say, well, we have this really cool project, we'd like you to put some money in, and, they, and we say, we're gonna get the return from these emission credits that we're gonna sell, and they say to you, well, when will we be able to start to sell these emission credits? And you say, I'm not really sure. Are you sure you're gonna be able to, you know, sell these emission credits? Well, not really. Um, you know, because, you know, there was just uncertainty. I can hedge production risk. I can hedge price risk. I can't hedge binary risk, okay? There's just no way, and that creates, you know, so you need, you know, whenever you're develop, developing any kind of policy system to, you know, to incentivize the, you know, the deployment of capital, these types of things, stability is one of the key things out there. And you're, you, know, you should be willing to, frankly, sacrifice a bit of environmental integrity in order to make sure that you have a stable investment system. Right? Just to give one example, you know, we, it, we, we calculated at one point it would cost us about 250,000, 200 to 250,000 euros per project to get it registered with the UN FCCC. So when you have hundreds of projects, you start realizing while well, you go out there to raise capital. Um, we had a whole series of wind projects in China, all within approximately the same grid. Each of those, ultimately, it comes down to a coefficient, what you're earning per megawatt hour. You know, and in this particular area, I'm just giving you know, numbers out. This is not exact, but in this one particular area, we had seven or eight wind, wind facilities, which each spent you know, you know, 100 to 150,000 euros per project on. And the coefficients were 0.72 tons per megawatt hour, 0.68 tons per megawatt hour, 0 0.69, 0 0.73, 0 0.66. Meanwhile, think about the transaction costs that we have absorbed, the amount of time and materials and, you know, and effort to go around things that are truly marginal. Give me 0.5 tons and guarantee it from day one, and I can basically mobilize a lot more capital, use resources more effectively, and ultimately, you know, we're going to get the same, you know, and as I said, there are also the projects that don't qualify. Yeah, you're going to give some projects that maybe aren't deserving in. But ultimately, if you reduce it down, that was something the UN became completely obsessed with, um, with the environmental integrity of each and every ton. Just to give one other example, just because it's fun, we had a, we had a landfill gas project in Mexico in which you know, we, we had to account for the emissions for the electricity to run the control station of the, uh, and a few of the, uh, and a few of the, um, the, the you know, pumps and various other things on, on, the, on the site. And because we had had problems getting a intertie agreement with the local Mexican utility and we had to run the project, we came in, we brought in a Caterpillar genset, 250 kilowatts, 250 kilowatts, put that thing up there. We notified the UN that basically that there was going to be this change. We weren't using you know, Mexican utility grid factors for the time being. We were going to use this thing. 
The approximate difference was about 43 tons that year. I didn't get credits for that project for nine more months because they couldn't, because they were worried about the 43 bloody tons. Okay? Completely mad. Okay, so you know, again, this was this was the challenge, was you know, you had this incredible amount of transaction costs chasing completely marginal stuff in a 30 billion ton a year global economy. Okay? So Ultimately, it came down to the following. You know, there, there, there were tons of projects. I mean, right now, there's something like 3,000 registered projects, another couple thousand in the pipeline. The reality is that 50 projects, principally industrial gas destruction projects, and one or two very, very large, um, very, very large efficiency projects in, in Chinese steel mills, 50 projects are going to do, are going to do 50 percent of the reductions that the CDM created. What do we think about the transaction costs around all the people working on all these hundreds or thousands of projects around the world, you know, working dedicated to fill this market? Seems a little bit irrational, doesn't it? So, and thus, skepticism emerges. However, what was the good thing that happened? Okay? Lo and behold, you have an infrastructure. You have a culture that was created. You had, you know, again, I had, a, I had a company that had offices in 16, in 16 different countries around the world, had reps in about another 10, you know, and had ultimately had projects in about 40 different countries at one time or another. Uh, consulted in another 30 odd or so, but, you know, never ended up getting projects in those space. We created an entire class of entrepreneurs who looked at every single asset, like we talked at the beginning, that looked at energy, that looked at services, that looked at transport, that looked at land use, that looked at agriculture and tried to figure out how can I reduce emissions and stick this through this obtuse UN system and make money. That is a cultural shift of enormous proportions. And that's something that should not be under-recognized because we, that's out there right now. This, this, this class of entrepreneurs that went out there and did that assuming that, you know, in good faith that we're going to have this long-run market for creating these reductions, right now exists, you know, is basically out there building wind plants and building landfill gas plants and doing everything that they can, looking for other incentives. But that is a, that, I believe, is the single greatest accomplishment of Kyoto to date. Because, frankly, you know, the CDM is probably going to reduce a billion to a billion point one tons in its lifetime. Since Kyoto, we've emitted roughly, what's the number, uh, uh, 400 billion tons? Uh, oh, wait, that's not right. Uh, 200 billion tons? It's in the error margin of the error margin, as I like to put it. You know, there's just, it's meaningless when it comes to the actual atmosphere of chemistry, but it's extraordinarily important in terms of business culture that seeks out ways to look at an emissions, uh, at, at the emissions profile of an asset and how to impact that. Okay, and the vast majority, the vast, vast, vast majority of ideas around that and business models around that were never touched because the 50 Chinese chemical plants out there took half the market. So, anyway, and as my friend of mine is like, has once said to me, you only keep, learn by doing if you keep doing. I just, uh, so we're at the stage right now where we have to find other policy dynamics, other structures that allow that culture to continue forward. And that's what I'm working on now. So just going back, you know, now let's, where are we today? Let's assume we have this sort of, this runway now. Um, I'll just go to the next slide because I think they kind of repeat. We have sort of multiple ways of how we deal with the emissions conundrum, as it were, okay? The first, which is popular in, in certain circles, is let's just do massive amounts of research and figure out the technologies that are going to fix everything. You know, fusion, orbital, solar, deep core geothermal, things that are you know, big engineering and research based. And my guess is that there's a handful of folks in this room that probably spend their working days thinking about stuff like that. I think it's incredibly important, but at the same time, you know, it's pretty much binary risk taking. You know, you pull it off or you don't. And, you know, and then even if you get the technology in place, the reality is we have this huge emissions, embedded emissions infrastructure right now that is going to take decades to change over, okay? And you don't just immediately, you know, take everything offline and put in your new fancy fusion reactor. You got to figure that out. And yet that has to be done within <coughs> the construct of the, of the economies that we live, that we live within. So again, you know, this is a, this has to be done, and ultimately, this is going to be 
a big part of the equation as we get past, you know, say 2050 or something like that. But the reality is that this is, you know, as far as I'm concerned, this is not a policy unless we believe, you know, as the Wall Street Journal argued on the, uh, on the op-ed page this morning, that we really don't have to worry about this right now and got 16 scientists from various different corners of the world to, to, uh, to sign on to. Well, let's not worry about this. Let's just do research and we'll figure it out later. That's, that's one scenario. I don't know who buys into that. I don't think that's, you know, that's not, I don't want to be rolling the dice on, on, the, on, this, on this plan. Option two is what we call the super sovereign approach, which is frankly what we've been doing the last you know, 20 years. The idea that we as a, as a you know, society can come together uh, as countries and agree to a way of managing the global commons that, that frankly takes away a, a bit of individual national sovereignty. As I say, the Europeans love this idea because they've already done it. Uh, nobody else is particularly, particularly keen on this. The reality is, you know, we're going into, I think, the key thing to think about the super sovereign agreement is that only two countries really matter, the United States and China. And the United States and China are operating in a, you know, we're dealing with one of the profound geoeconomic political shifts of any generation right now. We're moving from a unipolar world to a multipolar world, and nobody knows exactly what that means. This involves trade, this involves finance, this involves intellectual property, this involves sea lanes, this involves an incredibly dynamic relationship between the world's two largest emitters, one who is on the ascent, one who is on the decline, okay? This issue around how you manage emissions sits right in the middle of that highly, highly complex dialogue that is, as I say, this is, you know, when you, when you realize that the last person in the room with Barack Obama in the Copenhagen Accord was the National Security Advisor, not the EPA, not the Energy Secretary, not the Secretary of State, the NSA, okay, was the last person advising Barack Obama on this. That's the level this is, okay? And, you know, it's quite interesting, you know, when, you know, uh, uh, friends of mine have, have, have made the argument that the climate negotiations around that are one of the key areas where, frankly, the U.S. and China butt heads in a fairly safe environment, okay? It's one that, you know, that they can, you know, they can agree to disagree and, you know, so. So the multipole, you know, basically coming up with a global regime strikes me as extraordinarily unlikely if half the global regime by emissions, the U.S. and China, simply, isn't, simply aren't interested. If China is changing now, and that's not out of the question that we're at that stage, you know, Durban, the, you know, two years after Copenhagen, we had the Durban uh, conference in uh, South Africa, the first one I haven't gone to in eight years. It's nice to not go. Um, you know, Durban, China indicated a, 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 a willingness to come forward. And, you know, one of the theories out there is that, you know, that if this is the way, one of the m mechanics in which we manage the global commons over the coming, you know, 100 years. You know, the, the way, you know, the, the, the regimes we put in place post-World uh, post War, War II, you know, Bretton Woods, the IMF, the World Bank, the UN system, uh, even to some degrees the WTO, were basically American-driven systems. And, you know, countries like China, at the very best, clawing their way, can get themselves up to maybe the kid, you know, the kid table on the end of the table. Does China see climate as a way to manage, you know, to be their big table for the, 21st, for the 21st century. Theoretically, that's a possibility. In that case, they want to lead, and they want to basically be the definer of this, and given the amount that they've been investing in low carbon, while at the same time emitting like crazy, it's not an absolutely outrageous thought. But again, multilateral agreements, you know, it's going to be a lot of work. I mean, you, know, you go to one of these conferences, there's, there were 40,000 people in Copenhagen, there were 20-odd thousand in Durban, you know, it's just a gigantic mess. You know, you're exhausted. You're just, you know, it's, it's, I find it improbable to think that we're going to get a real multilateral agreement with teeth that's going to mean anything. How am I doing on time? Good. Okay. Which leaves us with, the, with what we have, a muddle, okay? Bottom up, and that's what's happening right now, is basically the technology has really moved. I mean, compared to where we were able to deliver a kilowatt hour of solar or wind or efficiency 10 years ago versus today, we've made enormous advances. Countries are seeing this. There's a lot of fragmented drivers around low carbon that are not about the global commons. 
but about other issues, energy security being among them. The vast majority of countries in the world cannot drill or dig their way to energy security. And as supply chains of oil and natural gas get longer and tighter, uh, you, know, you run into situations, and I, you know, I can tell you from direct experience in Thailand this is the case, where, where, and Chile as well, where the issue around how do we take the top end of a curve off of, of our energy cost when things spike is a very, very, very key issue. When oil hit $145 a barrel a couple years ago in Thailand, Thailand faced a choice of basically changing a law and probably having revolution in the streets or going bankrupt. Now, price came down, but those were the, those were the issues they were dealing with. So basically, domestically produced energy, which in Thailand's case is gonna be largely based upon efficiency and clean energy, is a very sound policy. Local pollution, export markets, et cetera, you're seeing a lot of things emerging around essentially creating local policies that create uh, drivers for the same kind of thing that we were trying to stuff through the CDM for all those years, instead of going through bond to get that additional value that, you know, how we buy down the risk, going through, you know, the regular, you know, the, the policy process in Bangkok or Jakarta or Nairobi or Mexico City or whatever it may be. So that's a, you know, that's a much more tangible way for entrepreneurs who are out there looking to reduce emissions to engage with, you know, with the value creation process around that, rather than going through this, you know, as I say, obtuse process at the UN level. Um, so basically, what, what that means is we don't have a single market. We won't have a single market around this. It's going to be done in ways that countries are comfortable with. We have six provinces in China moving towards emissions trading right now. We have efficiency trading being done on screens in India right now. We have renewable fuel standards here in the US the around and renewable identification numbers around biofuels that are creating enormous arbitrage opportunities, both short term and long term. You know, and this is just, California is a, is a small carbon market, another small carbon market in Australia. It's being done in very different ways and in, in different places. And that's a very exciting thing because ultimately we're gonna start creating a lot more IP uh, than we did through the CDM because you know these things are going to build up in their own markets and look to export the IP that they create into other markets. That's what I think is really the exciting thing today because it's the key, and the key is you know how when you come up with a knowledge set around doing something in one place, how do you move it efficiently? How do you move that IP into another jurisdiction that largely has similar types of underlying conditions? physical, cultural, and business ecosystem conditions, okay? Because we don't, I mean, all you have to do is look at, you know, the way we deliver electricity around the world. There's, you know, every country has slightly different manners around which the way they even do that. There is no one solution, and solutions have got to be tailored to local conditions. Let's see. I don't think I really need to go through that. I've talked about, I've talked about that. Ultimately, though, technology is just one part of it. You know, you need, you, know, you need business ecosystems on the ground that can deliver the technology, that can deliver the finance to put the technology in place, that can manage it. Down in Chile, for example, I was just talking to a colleague down there who, you know, there's a huge push for, for renewables, particularly sort of small utility scale solar in the Atacama Desert up in the north. Right now, there is no, there is no business ecosystem that can deliver solar at scale into Chile. You can get the panels to the port, but how you get them into the ground and how people put them in, what the, and you know, frankly, the hardware and software around that, that doesn't exist. Two years from now, that's going to exist, okay? Where do you take the knowledge from, you know, for example, Thailand, which I mentioned before, which now has, you know, has these sort of five to 15 megawatt plants popping up like crazy, you know, is there a way to accelerate you know, the knowledge from one market into another market, both around you know, how do you create the policies that worked in one place and accelerate them into other places? So that's, um, that's largely, I think, where I'm at. So essentially, we're looking at a fragmented carbon world. We will see environmental commodities in different places being an important part of this, but they're not the only one. You're going to see feed-in tariffs. You're going to see depreciation allowances. You're going to see an enormous number of tools out there for different countries to use and ultimately start transferring information across jurisdictions as they get big enough as, as you start, you know, as I say, you take, you, you get, reach market saturation in one market, you move to another. I think we need to think more about 
rather than about gross tons of emissions, we need to start be thinking about how much market share in defined market segments is the low carbon world getting? How do we get low carbon, zero carbon, whatever it may be, to own more and more of the market share of a particular opportunity in India or Vietnam or Mexico, or whatever it may be? That's a metric I think that people can really understand, and that's one that I think countries will resonate to more directly than you know, the idea of taking a credit and helping a European, you know, helping a European utility save a little bit of money. Um, and that's really, you know, again, looking at, you know, it's, it's a combination of short-term opportunities and long-term opportunities. And you know, I'm an entrepreneur, and I, the people I work with are entrepreneurs. We look at, at you know, as I say, the, those moments of arbitrage where, you know, where there's, knowledge, there's a knowledge gap, and we try to fill it. And sometimes, you know, if you think it's this long-term stable, you invest money in a company. And if you think it's something short-term that you're go you ultimately don't have a comparative advantage in, you invest short term and you just do something that, like a trade. And I think that's my last one. I hope that made some sense. And uh, I appreciate it. And I think we have, we have some time for some questions and stuff. Yes, we do. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'm taking the chair off. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And before we start the questions, here's a little play that <laughs> Awesome. Interesting talk at LBL. Thank you. Now my children will actually stand, understand what I do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. What's that? So, 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 so I only got this after I finished the talk. You notice that? <laughs> yes. Uh, very interesting talk. I'm Alan Sandstad in uh, EETD. I have a question I want to uh, highlight. The, the point you made about uh, the the the, the, the contribution of the Kyoto, even the unsuccessful Kyoto Protocol, to building the uh, trading infrastructure around the world. Uh, in the United States, sort of starting roughly in the last half decade, about a half decade ago, one saw private money being thrown at clean energy in anticipation that the federal government would be passing climate legislation mm -hmm. and putting a price on carbon. Yep. Of course, then that's gone with the failure of Wax and Markey. So my question is, how much can the muddling through uh, succeed, really, without a price, without finally uh, a price on carbon being recognized by one of the major governments? Uh, very good question. Um, uh, the truth is I don't know. Uh, you know I, I'm, I'm trying to deal with the reality we're dealing with right now and trying to be hopeful around that. I look at the U.S. and I see a couple different things. First of all, you, know, you see this ongoing profusion of renewable portfolio standards and this ongoing profusion of, of next generation biofuel incentives as reasonably good proxies for, if not carbon pricing, at least for driving those technologies and driving investment around those. Do I need a carbon price per se, or do I need various you know, requirements for you know, delivery of certain amounts of renewables? Is that good enough? And I, my answer would be that's good enough. I've you know, I recently got a presentation from one of the renewable credit brokers who was looking to have me participate in an investment round in them. And when they showed me the numbers around the portfolio standards, uh, growth over the coming years, I was fairly astonished. I had no idea that this was happening to that degree. I think, the, you know, again, you know, in terms of, in terms of you know, the, the investments that were made, the reality is that you know, the, the, the venture community, you know, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be taking fairly substantial losses on the development of that IP, but that doesn't mean that IP disappeared. That means somebody smart buying it on 20 cents on the dollar and finding a new, uh, finding a new home for it. You know, again, you know, I, I think that you know, it's, uh, we can have a whole conversation about the, around VCs and their understanding of project finance and, and project development, things like that, which is pretty minimal. But I think that the, you know, to answer your main question, proxy, proxy policies along lines of portfolio standards and um, efficiency standards and, uh, and, renewal and, you know, and next generation fuel standards are probably good enough for the moment. So uh, this is Ed Vine, and I'm. He's going to ask me a really hard question, and I'm not going to be able to answer it. Okay. Well, just following on Alan's uh, question, it, it, I thought it was a great presentation, very realistic. This is where we are. This is how we're muddling through, but it's disheartening for people who are really worried about climate change, and about the goals that people have set, and about the ability to reduce the emissions. Using your model, we may have you know, a project in Costa Rica, a project in Mexico, a project in China, but by themselves, we probably won't get to where we need to get given 
this sort of model you've laid out. So are you saying we should give up and this is the best we can do and take it there? Or is there something more that could be done that perhaps hasn't been done? I, I think that I, you know, this, is a, this is a qualitative answer at best. Um, yeah. I think that you know, one of the key things to recognize is that you know, we are dealing with a, such, an incredibly, such an incredible asymmetry of, of value proposition in Kyoto, you know, between countries that were capped and countries that were uncapped. And that, you know, that ultimately that was not sustainable in the long run. And now that we're moving towards a, what, what we, we need to build out more capability. And if that, and I fundamentally think that, you know, you can see an acceleration of businesses that deliver low carbon, whether via technology or via execution platforms or whatever it may be, but you have to start. And I agree with you, I, it would be great to have a global, we don't have it. And it is disheartening, okay? But at the same time, we need to find ways to keep that culture, you know, that, say, that business culture around low emissions. And if we have local regimes, and I say, I've got companies that are building substantial amounts of clean energy in Thailand right now, okay, without thinking one whit about the global regime. Gas flare reduction, solar, biomass, low head hydro, all happening in Thailand because Thailand has put in a very positive feed-in tariff regime that smart people are running to fill. How do you do that is made different. So at that point, so when we come back to the conversation about a real global regime, let's say four, five, six, whatever years that from now, countries have more recognition that they actually have something to, they have a positive benefit from this as well. And I think that that cultural side is, is important as well. But yeah, I'm not gonna disagree with you. It'd be better if we had Kyoto too, but we don't. Uh, Bill Miller, it, I have a, it's a question about the support for this uh, uh, patchwork of policies that we have today and that we yeah. will have at least near term. And it has to do with the uh, amount and type of secondary finance because it, you may have a patchwork of policies that's encouraging. What do you mean secondary finance, just like what you uh, Well, basically, so you've got a number of companies, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but at what point can the, basically the capital that is required for that be bundled and sold, can be parsed, bundled, and sold? At what point can we get, say, uh, maybe the European pension funds will never come back, but you know, at what point can we start accessing very large pools of capital that are accumulating elsewhere, basically through secondary um, uh, finance markets, because I think we get a patchwork of policies that is sort of our bridge mm -hmm. to whatever future is f coming for us. We get uh, a large amount of technology coming out of institutions like this that mm -hmm. supports those advances. But then the question is, where does the money come from? Where does the hundred billion a year come <laughs> from that's going to support the growth of those things? And at some point, we'll start to reconcile and grow and do this through, mm -hmm. through larger regimes. But where does that money come from? Uh, have you noticed the way that uh, Chinese banks are supporting Chinese uh, clean energy exports these days. Staggering. I mean, essentially, you know, well, it's, it's what I would do as well. I mean, ultimately, you know, the Chinese are sitting on trillion dollars plus of treasury bills that aren't, or that aren't earning, you know, any interest and have a pretty substantial risk of being depreciated at some point over the next couple of years. They're flopping those into productive assets like crazy. They're providing finance behind, frankly, Chinese Solar and Chinese wind. Very. Does this get back to the fact that it was the NSA that was the last person to give counsel? That in fact, it's, this is where China take, uh, makes its stake in the country. Exactly. Um, I think that you know. I think that you know. The reality is that it, a big chunk of it is going to come from, you know, the the, the large sovereign wealth funds. Okay. Um, uh, and you know, and China and Chinese capital at this point. I don't think it's, you know. It, there's, you know, you're going to have to repurpose capital. You can't just sit in T-bills and other things. You need to find ways to moving, moving that into the market. And my guess is that's, just, that's where it's going to be coming from. You know, right now, I, I'm aware of a, of a Chinese entrepreneur that I worked with a number of years ago who is setting up, basically, it's fairly small, like half a billion dollars. And he's basically tracking the Chinese investment into Africa and looking for ways to putting, you know, basically efficiency investments on the back end of, of the Chinese mine, train, et cetera, investments in Africa. That's cool, you know? Again, when, when you're experimenting with half a billion bucks, things are good. Thank you. Hi. Uh, 
Oh, sorry. No, Somebody no. has the mic. <laughs> um, two questions. One, what are the verification processes? And number two, what are the similarities and differences uh, with emissions trading and uh, carbon tax? <laughs> okay. Um, verification processes, essentially, there's two stages of that in this project-based mechanism that I maintain is dying very quickly. Um, you have the initial process of getting a project qualified, which involves putting together an enormous amount of documentation, having an accredited auditor review your documentation generally on the ground, basically uh, giving their approval, that going into the UN process, that project being registered, and then once that project is registered, the productivity of that project is, is then, then checked on a regular basis. You have, you know, frankly, you have meters. You have, other, you have other metrics that are used as proxies for the carbon savings because you, know, you can never actually measure a reduction. It's, just, it's, always a, it's, always a counter, it's always a counterfactual against what you projected was going to occur. But you measure whether it's tons of steel or kilowatt hours, whatever it may be, according to metering process, and you go through audit, et cetera, et cetera. It's pretty standard business processes. The difference between emissions trading and a carbon tax, um, that's pretty one-on-one. -on -one. Um, basically, emissions trade, you know, with a carbon tax, you know, you're basically, you are not guaranteeing performance. You are, you are, you are using that for revenue, for revenue raising. Um, with emissions cap, and, you know, you're, you're basically guaranteeing some level of performance. Uh, that's, 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 the, that's the fundamental, fundamental difference there. I mean, is that what you're, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, that's a really broad question. Okay, sorry. we can talk about it. Sorry, we have time for only two more questions. Given I'm sorry, I babbled. <laughs> okay, um, what's, uh, uh, given that this um, industry is, is likely to, be, to continue to be rather boom and bust over mm -hmm. the next few years, what's, what are the issues with managing to maintain the uh, skills in finance that we've... Again, you know, I think it's important to realize you know, that there are all sorts of questions about carbon projects and you know, additionality and whether they were real. It's, you know, whether, the one thing is that no project ever earned a credit if it didn't run. Okay, so the skills around basically people running projects that, reduced, that produced a core product, whether it's a more efficient steel plant or whether it's a, whether it's a wind power plant, whatever it is, those skills, you know, again, you know, the key thing is to have you know, domestic regimes in place that allow those skills to, to still you know, you know, build into the market. You know, that's, that's, that's the key thing right now. You know, the reality is, you know, as I say, the commodity of a carbon credit is nothing more than a mathematical algorithm that reflects something that happened on the ground somewhere in the world. The really important thing is what happened on the ground. The credit itself for the allowance is just, as I say, it's an abstraction. Okay? We don't need those skills. You know, whether a bunch of bankers from Barclays lose their jobs, I don't really care. Okay? What I want is I want the skills of the people that build the wind plants and build the landfill gas plants and build the methane compressors and do all that stuff. Those are the ones we need to keep the business in. And that comes from local policy that drives, uh, that drives that innovation or that execution. Hi. Uh, I like your point about the 50-50 issue, mm -hmm. and it seems like it's based off of one problem, though, um, that all global warming pollutants are covered under one framework, the six main pollutants. Mm -hmm. I mean, if HFCs had not been included, that problem would not have existed. Is Absolutely. there any hope to create more fragmented frameworks for each pollutant, wouldn't that be wiser? Yeah, I mean, th 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 you know, there, there's, a, there's a flip of the coin of that question as well. Basically, the asset classes that are included in the ability to create credits or have, or, or, you know, have, um, you know, or have debits, as it were, is very political. I mean, the reality is you know, the single biggest emission source in the world is, is uh, or one of the biggest, is, uh, is tropical deforestation. Okay? We can't do a darn thing about tropical deforestation under Kyoto because, you know, but that is a major emission source. So the choice to exclude that was, you know, give, made that there were no mechanisms from this financial side. HFCs would be another one. Um, you know, soot and, uh, and, you know, the issues around, around that is another one that was not included in Kyoto. Uh, 
So again, yeah, there was a fairly, you know, one might say random decision <laughs> made in Kyoto. I, I would agree though, I think that they're, you know, horses for courses. You know, the reality is we should be able to find a way to finance the incinerators on the back of HFC production via a mechanism far more socially efficient than the emissions trading. You know, emissions trading created obscene economic rents off the back of, you know, HFC, off the, off the back of HFCs. And, um, you know, we should be able to socially just base, come up with a fund like we did in Montreal protocol or whatever it may be to do with that. At the same time, you know, one of, you know, all my friends who want to use the carbon markets to, uh, to you know, save tropical deforestation, I tell them, listen, it's going to blow up the supply and demand balance. If you actually you know, succeeded in taking a serious chunk of tropical deforestation out and, you know, by reducing it, there is no remote demand of anybody with a commitment that could absorb that. The price would go to zero instantly. So you know, there's, you know, these are all political questions, and I fundamentally agree with you we need to start you know, segmenting out issues around financing, you know, the slowing of tropical deforestation, HFCs, renewables, methane, soot, et cetera. I would fundamentally agree that would probably be a good process. Dan, I would like to, why don't we close? Anybody can come and ask me another question, though. Thank you. <laughs>